All right, we're looking at prophecy, which are amongst the supernatural spiritual gifts. We have the regular spiritual gifts, which have been designated for us as we become born-again believers throughout this age of almost 2,000 years. Uh, the others, the biblical evidence for cessation of the others, of a number of spiritual gifts in the Bible, sets a precedent for the possibility that a spiritual gift can be temporary in this age. So we end, where do we go to find out what is the truth? Right to the Bible. And we're at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So an introduction to that. Dr. Robert L. Thomas states, No Bible verse specifically states that tongues, signs, and wonders will continue throughout the church age. <clears throat> Nor is there a verse that specifically states that they will cease at the end of the apost apostolic age. However, <clears throat> this does not mean that one cannot take a position on this issue. Many doctrines, such as the Trinity, are not directly stated, but are derived, derived from the study and correlation of passages in Scripture. I've often said, when you read a verse in the Bible, take it what it directly says, what it stipulates, but then also don't miss over what it implies. And that depends largely upon context, who, what, why, where, when, and to whom, and how, and so on. So there are several indications in the scriptures that the gifts of tongues, healing, and miracles, signs and wonders, which will not continue. What has this got to do with prophecy? To authenticate the fact that you are a legitimate prophet of God, you've got to do some miraculous things to then establish, well, this guy is not just talking through his hat. He's coming from God because if you make a mistake, uh, in prophetic issues, uh, that's a serious thing because that's supposed to be scripture. That it has not been yet penned. Now, if you're quoting from scripture, you're not a prophet. You're just teaching from scripture, and that gift is there and will not change until the end of the age. So the charismatic movement, in all its forms, rests not on exegetical evidence that the gifts will continue, but on the assumption, contrary to history, that since they occupy, occurred in the apostolic age, they should also occur today. By the way, where are the apostles? That's a gift, and it's ceased. It's served its function. We already discovered it. It was used, utilized to establish a church and get it ongoing. Now, the foundation for this assumption is not existent. The New Testament church, I'm going to have to correct that, it's the church. It's not New Testament, Old Testament. That has to do with Israel. And in New Testament, Old Testament, it doesn't have anything to do with the, uh, their writings because the manuscripts don't say, well, these 27 books are part of the New Testament writings and these 39 books are part of the Old Testament writings because the Old Testament is the law. Not all of the Old Testament is about the law. That was added by publishers who actually publish books of the Bible in various languages of the world and then they Right there, this is the New Testament, and this is the Old Testament. Actually, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, refer back to when the Jews were on, in the age of Mosaic law, trying to keep the law in the temple and everything else. And that was the age in which Jesus arrived in the first century. They crucified him, and all of a sudden we have this transition that heretofore was a mystery called the church. Not the New Testament church, just the church, body of Christ composed of not just Jews, not just Gentiles, but a combination of the two, both married into one in the body of Christ. The New Testament church was not characterized by power and miracles as the charismatics assumed. It was characterized by the problems addressed in the epistles, including the problems that beset the Corinthian church, which were in 1 Corinthians 13, and the problems of the churches described in Revelations, Revelation 2 and 3. The Charismatics assume that the church today should, should be like their imaginary church. They assume that the entire church today should be able to do all the, possible, all the apostles did in the early eight stages of the Greek Bible, as reported in there, in the church age. If the church as a whole had performed miracles, it is only an assumption, apart from evidence, that this should be true today. This assumption is not interpretation. 
The assumption that the miraculous events recorded in the book of Acts should occur today is a distinct hermeneutic, a distinctively Pentecostal manner of approaching the scriptures. The development of theology on the basis of narrative rather than on direct teaching of scripture is always a precarious methodology and often goes wrong. So there's general biblical evidence for a cessation. Moses performed a series of miracles. However, they did not continue throughout the Hebrew Bible's reports, nor were other believers expected to do the same. So the, the prophets in Moses' time, Moses was the first prophet in Deuteronomy 18, specifies and defines that activity. They occasionally perform miracles, often to authenticate who they were. But Israel in general was not expected to do so, nor did the miracles continue throughout Israel's history. The fact that some individuals on special occasions in biblical history perform miracles as reported in the Hebrew Bible did not result in others doing the same or in a continued continuity of those miracles. So there is no reason to assume that since the apostles and a few members of the early church perform miracles, they are to be expected today. Specific biblical evidence for cessation. Now the gift of apostle was temporary and ceased. In addition to evidence from history, there is also specific biblical evidence that certain gifts were temporary. The term apostle, commonly used in ancient times in the sense of representative, like the angelic beings, often referred to that, in a few passages describes representatives of a local church. This is not the church age gift of apostleship, nor can this term, contrary to its normal meaning and contrary to the Greek Bible, or the church age writings, descriptions, be equated with a modern missionary merely on the basis of etymology. The only individuals in the, in the church age who clearly possessed the miraculous gift of apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ and could perform miracles as required of an apostle were who? The twelve and Paul. Perhaps Barnabas and James can be included. Almost every branch of the church, including most Pe Pentecostals, has held that apostles in the sense that have in the, in the sense, have not continued in the church. The charismatic reliance on the narrative of Acts is often avoided when defining apostles and prophets as too restrictive. So who's going to change it? You're going to editorialize? These gifts can be precisely delineated, however. Imprecise use of scripture is a common failing among charismatics. No matter how one tries to broaden the term apostle, there is little doubt that apostles such as the Twelve and Paul did not continue. If they did not, then all things are not as they, they were in the church age. Church. All mirac miraculous gifts did not continue as in the beginning church, and at least one gift in the church age did not continue. So we have precedent for that. Now we examine the details to see if it's supported. In the light of a vacuum, or not, inf not enough information, I think we better stick with what we can prove out from Scripture. In addition, the, the, the uh, church age sets standards for an apostle, church age writings for an apostle that preclude the continuance of this gift. Not only must an apostle be able to perform miracles, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, not only was the early church very careful about granting anyone, even Paul, the title of apostle, Galatians 2, 1 to 10, but also an apostle must have, been, have seen the resurrected Lord, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 to 2, and Acts 1, 22 to 26. Paul explicitly stated that he was the last one to see the resurrected Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, and he specifically connected this fact with his apostleship. And this requirement for apostleship refers to genuine appearances of the resurrected Christ and not the visions. There have been no resurrection appearances since the apostolic age. Paul clearly stated that the last appearance was to him. Revelation 1, 12 to 18 refers to a vision and is not an appearance of the resurrected Lord in bodily form on earth. And therefore, apostles in the sense of the twelve and Paul cannot occur today. Since apostle, <clears throat> in the first sense of the gift, was only a temporary gift, and did not continue in the church, the biblical precedent is established that some gifts given in the apostolic age 
did not continue and were only temporary. It is contrary to Scripture to assume that all gifts and all happenings in the apostolic church are to continue and to be expected in today's church. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians 13.10. But when that which is complete comes, the partial will be done away with. Well, let's just stay there for a second. And go to this passage ahead of time and review 1 Corinthians chapter 13. A lot of C studies I've done over the years. There it is. First Corinthians 13, 8 to 13. Read it from the beginning of the key passage. Love never fails, but where the gifts, where there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there's knowledge, it will be done away with. So somehow, somewhere along the line, they'll be done away with. Now, jumping ahead in Joel chapter 2. These things will be revived when the Lord comes again. So how do they continue on to the last second when he comes again? They haven't ceased. And this says they will. When he comes again, they will continue on. So we have to know there has to be a, pro a period of time when they're not available. Well, we know in part and we prophesy in part. So they're partial gifts. But when that which is complete comes, the partial will be done away with. Got it? That's the context. So verse 10 speaks of the time when that which is complete comes. Let's discover what that is. Not the time when that which is perfect comes. That which is complete. Totelion, literally. That which is complete in all its parts. And what gender is it? Neuter gender. What could that be? Okay. So it ruled out the completed scriptures. Because it wasn't available at the time in the first century when Christ ascended. Then they started moving on, testifying to who he was and what he did. He's the promised Hamashiach of the Hebrew Bible of Moses' time, written then, the Pentateuch, and then all the prophets in their writings, became scripture. That's what they went by in the first century. They didn't have a Greek Bible yet that specifically referred to Jesus Christ, the perfect, the one, the last, first and last prophet of all time, and the testimony of who he is and what he did propitiation for our sins. That's the gospel. You believe in that, you have eternal life. That's what they testified to, but it wasn't written yet. So those temporary gifts testified to that so that when you spoke of Jesus ascending and he was the Hamashiach, the promised Messiah to come that died on the cross for sins, well, who are you? Because other people were saying other people were the Hamashiach all throughout the ages, even in the Hebrew times, Israel's times. So, totalian is not an absolutely perfect thing, which is an alternative meaning. It is most likely defined here, concerning the context and usual usage, as that which is complete. Is not our canon of Scripture complete now? Yes. As opposed to that which is classified here as that which is partial, the miraculous spiritual gifts of prophecy and word of knowledge, for example, which it replaces. Authenticating who he is and... The content of the prophecies not only were miraculous foretelling to authenticate the fact that you are a true prophet of God, but it also forthtelling, telling of who you're witnessing, your eyewitness or accounting of who Christ is. So you have the information, it's now trustworthy because it was sealed and authenticated by the miraculous spiritual gift exercise of the prophet. Reasons why totalian cannot mean the perfect in 1 Corinthians 13.10. Robert Thomas, the most common definitions of the English word perfect applied to 1 Corinthians 13.10 would probably include being entirely without fault or defect, corresponding to an ideal standard or abstract concept, the soundness and the excellence of every part, element, or quality of a thing frequently, frequently as an unattainable or theoretical state. Either of these three are a combination of them is the usual notion the average person attaches to the word. All three are qualitative in nature, a characteristic that renders them unsatisfactory renderings of totelion. Four reasons demonstrate this. No other use of teleos in Paul can possibly mean perfection in the sense of the absence of all imperfection. 
In fact, the meaning of perfection is 